Good evening and welcome to Behind the Headlines. Today is Wednesday the 7th of April 2021 and in this programme tonight we will be discussing the big deployment of Russian troops to Ukraine's borders and asking could this lead to a wider conflict. Um, yes, you have missed this major news story that uh, the uh, Russian forces have amassed something like over 25,000 troops tanks and other military hardware right on uh, Ukraine's eastern border. And uh, there has barely been any coverage of this on our mainstream media. And uh, this could instigate not only a European war, but also a global war as well. Uh, Reagan, um, I'm just amazed that the Lord provides us with these, these stories to cover. And yet stories like this seem to be off the radar that yeah. these big, massive news corporations <coughs> are failing to mention these incredibly geostrategic news stories that have the whole of uh, European security um, a threat. Uh, yeah. And particularly the fact that the Putin has decided to deploy only last week 25,000 Russian troops to the border of Ukraine to escalate that conflict with the Ukrainian. He couldn't even have a full-out um, invasion of that country. Uh, and yet, COVID-19, the vaccine, that is what our mainstream media is concerned about. And I find this extremely alarming. Absolutely. I mean, if you... <laughs> Like you say, say, it's amazing God's providing us with these stories. And yeah, I would rather he give us some other positive news um, and stories. Honestly, if you look at some of the, the stuff that we've been talking about it and the state of our world, it, it just is pointing so much to um, a deepening depravity, uh, we, going further and further away from the Lord. Um, there's a lack of perspective. I think that... Um, a lot of the absence of this story from mainstream media outlets is it's because quite a few people don't even care. It's The perspective is, oh, that's something happening out over there. Let's look at it this way. Quite a few people don't believe in Jesus Christ, right? Just putting it simply, quite a few people, um, understatement, don't believe in Jesus Christ, meaning they don't believe he's coming again. They don't believe in the return of Jesus Christ, meaning that um, all of the prophecies in the Old Testament and New Testament yet to be fulfilled are off their radar, meaning that um, Russia, which does fit in, as we'll see and this evening, and in, to some Bible prophecy, um, that's, that's all the way over there. I, you know, it's, it's quite a few hours away. Not too many people go there, want to go there on holiday. Um, so let them sort out that. Let's talk about the potential of blood clotting and as a result of vaccinations. You know, it's, so everything has been smothered out by, um, I think, a very selfish f mentality that is, it's exclusively Britain focused. I mean, you, used to you could have a good bit of international news on BBC. I've not seen any of this uh, uh, apart from just searching Russia or Ukraine news. That's how, that's how I'm aware of it. But it goes back um, all the way, really, to 2014, 2015. Uh, this, this has been brewing for that long. And here in the West, we've just, we've been missing all of the signs. We've been avoiding the reality. We've been ignoring what's going on. And it might come back to bite us hard. Yeah, it could have absolutely devastating consequences. So just to remind you, we are live. We are interactive tonight. So we'd love your views and your opinions. So please uh, feel free to email into the program or text the program. Uh, and our big question tonight is, are we heading for war with Russia? And uh, it'd be great to hear from you. Uh, I, I just want to talk about this one because the first major conflict we saw with Russia and Ukraine was back in 2014. Uh, and then we saw, for example, Russian troops entered the Crimea. The, uh, the government of uh, Putin's government <coughs> decided to annex the Crimea, which was uh, an incredibly strategic port belonging to the Ukrainians. Um, and then what they did is they backed U Russian separatists in the Ukraine. So since 2014, uh, we've had more than 14,000 people have been killed in that conflict and more than 3,000 civilian deaths. Mm. And it's just like this unreported war 
that seems to be in the eastern Ukraine that doesn't have any particular relevance mm. to us here in the West. But the, uh, the Ukrainian president wants to apply to become a, a member of the NATO alliance. And if he does, that means that if any member of NATO is attacked, all have to go in defense of that one country, which would then drag us in uh, to this conflict. World War Three is <laughs> potentially. kind of potentially what we'd be looking at. I mean, if, if you bring in the Chinese and then you bring in the Iranians yeah, and uh, what have you, that has huge geostrategic importance and significance. A lot of ramifications. I mean, just if you think of that, 14,000 people, uh, maybe some of our viewers, I'd be curious if um, any of you have definitely not heard of this, um, please write in and say why you think that we've not heard of it. I mean, we've heard here from uh, from Johnny. I'm, I'm curious, Johnny, you might want to send another um, email through to um, explain your thinking here. It says, it seems there's a, an agenda to demonize Russia, especially by de Democrats in the US, I, I mean, it, while pandering to China. This has proved disastrous on several different levels. Like you to clarify that a little bit, because um, for many years there has been um, active, um, well, interaction, we could say, with Russia in a very cold way. I mean, in many ways we've seen uh, relations going back to Cold War era-esque um, type status, and that's with Republicans as well. So. Um, we've we've seen definitely um, a relationship breakdown. Um, if we look at what happened in 2014, the initial Minsk agreement in 2015, uh, and then we've had ongoing aggression by Russia um, in in Ukraine. Uh, 3,000 civilian lives is is not something that we can just blink at. Yet somehow we've missed it, somehow we have blinked at it. Um, it and, and then you have, going back just last year, Minsk II, there were, there were further agreements, there were further um, discussions last year that were just completely missed. Uh, again, COVID-19 covered all of that up. Um, you, you look at it and you think, okay, what exactly is happening? And uh, essentially the argument uh, comes down to this, Ukraine, quite understandably and rightly says, it has total control and sovereignty over the entire um, territory that is Ukraine. Russia says, no, you don't. You have limited sovereignty. We're going to take this patch and we might take more. And it, it reminds, it does remind me of some of the actions that we can see and study historically um, of in encroachment by uh, invaders prior to all manner of historical wars, but um, even in World War One and World War Two, some of the intra-national um, conflicts and debates going on, it, it, it has a troubling similarity to some of that. Yeah, of course it does. Uh, and we also got to recognise history in this part as well. I mean, you mentioned earlier that uh, relations between the United States and uh, Russia uh, have been very cold and very frosty, of course, started in 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution when um, uh, we, we saw that Lenin came to power with the, uh, with the Marxists and the communists, and then, of course, the brutality of Stalin's regime. Uh, and then Stalin only cooperated with us in the uh, Second World War because of his hatred for, for Hitler, because Hitler uh, went back on the Soviet Nazi pact and broke it and then decided to invade. Actually, coming up this summer, 80 years ago, and decided to invade the Soviet Union. So Russia became an ally of the West during the Second World War against uh, Nazism. And then, of course, the two major powers that emerged after the Second World War was the United States of America and uh, the Soviet Union. Of course, then we've had the Cold War. Uh, that started to fall after the collapse of the Berlin War in 1989. Uh, then we had uh, Boris Yeltsin as the Russian president, and we had a, a, a period of detente. Mm. But we had a kind of social moral decay collapse within Russia. And uh, one thing about the Russians is they're, they're a very proud nation. So we saw, uh, we saw um, uh, was Putin arise from the KGB. Mm. Uh, he was uh, one of the leaders of the KGB. 
became president and that's it. He's had a grip on power for the last 20 years or so. And he's just signed in legislation that will enable him to remain till 2036. How about that? That's extraordinary. <laughs> it's it's uh, uh, immense. Now, what happens if Russia goes into a full-scale invasion of Ukraine? Well, um, Ukraine's military is significantly weaker, uh, another significant understatement. It could call on approximately 100,000 reservists um, to duty. Now, just understand the scale of what's happening with the, the Russian military, okay? The, the Russian military has currently one million active military personnel, one million. Um, there are 2.5 million reservists. Potentially, if you take the total number of their military personnel who are in reserve, that number might go as high as 20 million, right? So 100,000 reservists that Ukraine could call upon. This is a situation that either requires all nations to just step back and say, oh, okay, sorry guys, sorry, sorry, our, um, Ukrainian friends, you know, just it has to be, and Russia takes over with the potential to take more and take more as we saw um, um, Hitler do uh, in World War II, um, or we all get involved. And this is what happens if um, Ukraine successfully joins NATO, then everyone does get involved. And or, or, the other, or the other mass. scenario is that Russian forces go into the Ukraine mm. and then invade the uh, Baltic states. Yeah. And those Baltic states are part of NATO, and then NATO would have to respond uh, in a military defense of the Baltic states. And, and before you know it, you've got a major, major European conflict on your hands. Well, I, either way, uh, y y we're headed towards a situation um, that it, it's rapidly escalating. This has been brewing since 2014. Um, world leaders have kept kicking it into the long grass. We saw um, Obama, Biden didn't particularly deal with it back in 2014. Um, Trump didn't really touch it that much. In fact, m none of us in the West have really paid much attention to it. And now we're we're faced with this situation where it's it's getting unavoidable. It has to be addressed. It has to be um, spoken of in some way. There's pressure um, to actually um, see the United States apply greater effort to enforce some of the agreements um, that um, were laid out in 2015 in the initial Minsk agreement that was aimed at providing a providing a roadmap out of the conflict, but. The, the U.S. isn't doing that. It's, it's not, it's giving, as we are here in the U.K., it's giving verbal support. Here we, we had uh, Boris Johnson and also European, uh, the European envoy uh, say, Kiev has unwavering support, or unwavering support, but you know, unwavering support that's expressed verbally, it, it doesn't mean much. I mean, what, what do you mean by unwavering support? Or is there going to be actual backup if this is a, uh, something that's going to develop into a full-on military assault? Now, in, in fairness, the Russian government has denied that it's doing anything. It said, you know, this is just part of its normal um, routine. And in fairness, it does regularly hold military exercises in that region. Yeah, but the big difference here is that the Russians before have been backing up yeah. the, uh, the Russian separatists in Ukraine. Now we're talking about 25,000 Russian troops heading straight to mm -hmm. the border of the Ukraine. And that buildup will get bigger. I mean, we even got um, tanks and, and weaponry coming from the massive continent that Russia is to come all the way over to the Ukraine. So they, this is what is the big difference here. Um, but also I think, uh, you know, President Trump took a kind of indifferent approach to Russia and the Ukraine, sat back, wanted to see what developments were mm -hmm. happening. But we see that uh, President Biden and his son, um, Hunter Biden, have huge commercial and business interests in the Ukraine, which is connected to this. Um, and, uh, you know, that could embroil them in a major, major conflict. So I, th I think it's also important because this could be 
accelerating in the next weeks and months to come and have huge, serious implications for Western and uh, European security. Let's have a look now at um, this uh, CBN news item that looks at the conflict in the Ukraine. This is what's left of houses near the frontline town of Zolote. By midday Tuesday, February 18th, 2300 explosions rocked the area as Ukrainian troops and Russian-backed separatist forces clashed in some of their fiercest fighting. Alexander Kornev was in his house when the first series of explosions went off. I had just turned around and then there was a boom. I was thrown back to the steps. I was lying down for 20 minutes. Ukraine said Russian fighters attempted to advance across the separatist line into Zolote, but were repelled. We have a powerful army. Provocations happen. The army responded firmly. CBN News journeyed 90 miles south from Zolote to another battle-scarred village. Numerous Ukrainian checkpoints meant we were getting close to the front lines. <laughs> Traveling with us, Sergei Rakuba, who grew up in this region of Ukraine. We're in the village of Opetna, which was a vibrant, uh, dynamic uh, community before the war started between Russia and Ukraine. And the front line is basically separating this village in half. Rakuba, joined by a team from the Mennonite Brethren Church, delivered food, water and other essentials to families and soldiers living in Opadnaya. February 2014, Russian so-called separatists launched a massive hybrid war into this part of eastern Ukraine, in essence taking a chunk of the country. Six years later, communities like this one are a ghost town, except for a few families who have lived here for most of their lives and who vow never to leave. Once home to 700 people, only 60 now live in Opatnaya. There's been no electricity, gas or running water for more than five years. The streets here lined with bullet-scarred homes. The majority of houses unlivable. But we know that even here, God is here and uh, people need to know, know the hope of God that he brings, the salvation. And so, it's, again, a special privilege to be able to pass out gifts, hand out food, and pray with people and just share the love of Christ. Rakuba and Weeby climbed the steps of a bombed-out apartment building carrying supplies. We have no light for the last five years. Come on in, guys. The 78-year-old Lida, she lives in this tiny room with her son and four cats. No heat, no water, very little food. But there is no place to go for me. There is nobody, you know, I can go to. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm staying here, I'm just waiting. I lived here for 50 years and I will stay here. Pro-Russian rebels control half her village and much of eastern Ukraine, including key cities of Donetsk and Luhansk. They still uh, here shooting, you know, farther there, at least once a day, once every two days, they still here shooting. 14,000 people lost their lives in this region, half since Russia and Ukraine signed an agreement to end the war five years ago. 30,000 have been wounded and nearly 2 million people displaced from their homes. Rakuba says it's a forgotten war and it weighs on him. My teenage years and youth were spent here in the towns of eastern Ukraine. I remember how difficult it was for a Christian at that time to share one's faith and in general for the church to build influence in Soviet society. The war over the past few years has added even more darkness. So why don't we pray? We'll pray in Russian if you don't mind. Rakuba, a native of Ukraine, now lives in the U.S. and heads Mission Eurasia, a Tennessee-based group training young people to transform the countries of the former Soviet Union for Jesus Christ. Our vision at Mission Eurasia is to bring hope to society through young leaders and now bring the gospel to the next generation and to those living through difficult situations like in eastern Ukraine. Hundreds of Mission Eurasia leaders and volunteers recently crisscrossed the war zone and countries of the former Soviet Union delivering 120,000 gift of hope boxes to children. 
CBN News was there as dozens of youngsters met in this church basement to pack boxes. This is so exciting to see so many young people are working on this project. And this is just one of the packing and distribution locations. Several teams fanned out across towns and villages near the conflict zone, holding evangelistic outreaches geared to reaching young people, many hearing the gospel presentation for the very first time. I learned Jesus can help me in many difficult moments and help me not to give up. Each event ending with boxes of hope given to hundreds of children, each containing toys, school supplies, a Christian kids magazine called Spark, and a children's storybook Bible. Once the kids get back to their apartments, they're obviously excited about rummaging through their gifts and looking at all the various things that they got. Uh, incidentally, the Bible, along with the Spark magazine and each shoebox, has this QR code uh, on the back so they can use their smartphone, scan the code, and within seconds, they will have access to all the various local churches that they can get plugged into. Canada-based ShareWord Global partnered with Mission Eurasia to distribute the Spark magazine and place QR codes on each box linked to a Bible app with loads of information for kids and parents. The Bible app includes uh, multiple languages in different translations of the Bible, and there's uh, over 200 languages that are in audio as well. Rakuba says every gift of hope box placed in a child's hands is a chance to introduce the love of Jesus and impact families in a war zone. The boxes symbolize the future with Christ, and when put into the hands of children, they take them home. They and their families will realize that there is hope in God, hope in Jesus. George Tallis, CBN News, Opatnaya, Eastern Ukraine. Amen. Uh, that was extremely inspiring and heartening just to see um, the resilience and perseverance, the hope that um, these people um, have and are giving to others. Um, please, viewers, pray for the church in Ukraine. Pray for um, Ukrainian Christians to remain faithful in the midst of much difficulty, particularly those who are in that um, very threatened eastern part of Ukraine. Um, these are real days of trial and difficulty for them. And if you are from uh, Ukraine, if you have access um, to this and are, are viewing this, we want you to be assured of our prayers and um, our heartfelt love um, for all that you are doing. We have some messages here. Um, Johnny clarifies his earlier comment, he says, hi, President Trump was relentlessly accused of being a puppet of Russia by the left, a ridiculous falsehood. There was a U.S.-backed coup in Ukraine that overthrew a pro-Russian regime. Uh, this involved far-right Ukraine groups. I'd argue Putin is a better and more popular leader than Boris or Biden. Good show, Johnny. Uh, thanks for that, Johnny. Uh, it's one of those situations I'm thinking I'm going to have to, uh, in light of what we're discussing, firmly disagree. Uh, I think Russia is very, very dangerous. Putin, doubtless, is a good leader, as were many uh, dictators. Has in, dictators, past, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, exactly. Um, so, Anita, she says, uh, hi, Simon and Reagan. It's always great to see you both. This new occurrence doesn't surprise me, but I remember the USSR studied Russian history from the late 1800s to the 1990s um, and know about some of the internal historical problems. <laughs> Sorry, Anita. When I first read that, I thought you were saying you studied it for that long, the late 1800s. <laughs> you studied that period of uh, Russian history. Uh, I get it now. I also taught many students from the newly separated countries, including a former uh, MIG fighter pilot from Russia who was a Christian, when they were able to come to the UK. It was a fascinating insight into a very different world. The communist regime had much in common with Hitler's regime. They were both evil, and Stalin killed more people than Hitler. Factually correct. Um, the problems within the Ukraine have indeed been bubbling since 2014, but problems have existed since way before this. The separatists want to ally with Russia and the rest of the Ukrainians prefer an alliance with the European Union, from what I recall. Uh, this is reminiscent of the invasion of Poland at the beginning of World War II. 
Um, Julian says, the only place you will hear this subject is on Forces News, which we watch every evening as my husband was a national serviceman on Christmas Island in the Cold War 1950s. Uh, whilst our eyes have been on China, my husband has been saying to me, be watchful of Russia as he served in Germany in the Cold War, and they will be quietly planning something. In 1950, there was always a danger of Russian troops wanting to get a foothold in Europe. Yeah. And, and to add to that, I mean, just looking at the, the facts here, that uh, there are already uh, 30,000, 32,000 Russian troops in the, stationed in the Crimea, and there's also 28,000 separatist troops in eastern Ukraine. So we're seeing an army being mobilised uh, for action. That there can be no doubt about that. But also it's important historically to recognise um, that Russia is in clear violation of its obligations under the 1994 Budapest Memorandum. Mm. Um, the effectively, the Ukrainians gave up their control of uh, nuclear weapons uh, in return that Russia would refrain from threats uh, and use of force against the political integrity uh, or political independence of the Ukraine. So clearly we see that Putin is in breach of the uh, Budapest Memorandum. And also looking back on it now, the Ukrainians now must be thinking, why did we concede to pressure to get rid of our nuclear weapons? Because if the Ukrainians had nuclear weapons, there's no way that Russia would be doing what they're doing right now, primarily because of fear of a uh, nuclear reprisal. But it just shows also how conflicts, state to state conflicts, can actually escalate. And uh, particularly when powers have nuclear weapons, then we really are talking end time scenario, that's for sure. Uh, over a quarter of a million troops have been amassed in that spot between 2014 and 2018. In 2018, Russia had amassed 19 battalions with over 77,000 troops, 1,000 tanks, 2,300 combat vehicles, over 1,100 artillery systems, and about 400 multiple launches. And who, who can forget, um, I, I remember, uh, it's not in, in our notes, but I believe there was a passenger aircraft. Yes, it was, yeah. There was a passenger aircraft that um, Russian military shot down. Did we, we heard about it. Was anything done significantly of substance? No, no, it, no, it, was, uh, it was blamed on, um, I think, uh, Russian separatist forces, but they end up finding out that the SAMs, surface to air missiles that were fired were Russian owned. Exactly. Um, so therefore the finger point directly at Russia. And I think that was also, uh, wasn't that a, a Malaysian air flight? Uh, went at the same time as a similar one went missing back in 2014. There were two. Because I know, because uh, I was on a, a day before, day after, I was on a plane to uh, to Washington, D.C., and I remember having that uh, the news headlines at the time. So it was quite a little bit of an eerie time to be uh, to be flying when, yeah. when you hear reports of the Russians shooting down a, a passenger. Two planes plane. disappearing, one yep. shot down. Uh, really, really difficult time. Um, but if you look at what's going, I mean, the separatists were blamed. It was proven that the missile was actually the, the, the Russian. The said this was a rogue. But separatists, um, th there's uh, an issue that it's believed that there are many actual Russian troops intermingling with the separatists. So the claim is uh, th th those guys all want to be with us. But actually, those guys contain a lot of those who are part of the, the actual Russian military. It's not like that those are separatists only. Um, it seems that there's been some heavy infiltration. Um, there's immense human cost um, that's come uh, on the 21st of April 2018. UN Representative Neil Walker announced that after four years of conflict, 3.4 million people in Ukraine are struggling to cope with the impact of the humanitarian crisis and urgently require humanitarian assistance and protection. It's believed more than 14,000 people have been killed, more than um, 3,000 civilians. We said that a bit ago. But then you have the issue that uh, we see again and again in war zones of landmines. And these have affected 1.9 million people just in eastern Ukraine. In 2017, over 235 civilians were killed or injured by landmines and other explosive remnants of war. It's horrific.
absolutely. And I think, you know, we, we can look at this and we can look at this from a geostrategic perspective, but we also have to look at this in a kind of human cost. Yes. Uh, the fact is that what, uh, you know, Russia has done is illegal under international law. Uh, they have annexed the uh, Crimea and uh, potentially now looking to launch a full-scale invasion of the Ukraine, um, which would be horrendous for the people of Ukraine, but also for other Eastern European states that have broken away uh, from the control and influence of the Soviet Union, uh, have aligned themselves with uh, the European Union and NATO, would then see themselves in the firing line of, uh, of Russian forces. And that's a very scary prospect. But earlier today, I interviewed uh, Major General Tim Cross um, from the British Army on, on his inside perspective of this growing conflict between Russia and the Ukraine. And uh, we're now joined on Behind the Headlines by uh, Major General Tim Cross of the British Army. Um, Tim, absolute pleasure that you can join us on uh, Behind the Headlines. Um, what do you make of what's happening now on the borders of the Ukraine? The fact that the Russians have now deployed over 25,000 troops to Ukraine's borders, as well as um, we're seeing a buildup of tanks and military weapons. Yeah, well, there's no doubt that these reports have been swirling around for a while and they've certainly hardened over the last uh, you know, week or two. And there's been an escalation, I think, in armed clashes between the, on the front line between Ukraine and Ukrainian forces and Russian-backed separatists. That's been going on for quite a while, of course, and since 2014, depends how you count, obviously, in the various reports, but certainly 13,000, 14,000 lives have been lost in this conflict that's been going on for the last half dozen years or so. And Ukraine has certainly accused Russia of massing troops um, on the border, thousands of military personnel, northern and eastern borders of Ukraine, uh, as well as in the Crimean, Crimean Peninsula, which of course was annexed by Moscow back in 2014 too. Um, and online researchers, people obviously from around the world can now get access to various bits and pieces. And they've looked at this and they've, they've identified troops being transferred to the Ukrainian borders from Western and Central Russia, including artillery, from as far away as Siberia. And online researchers have collected video and pictures showing Russian troops and armor being transferred across Russia to the border. Pictures of train carriages carrying tanks, uh, rocket artillery launchers, trains carrying contact troops um, and uh, so forth to the region. So it's definitely worrying. Now, I should add that, um, and going back, to you, going back to where we started, I'm now retired from the British Army, but I did 40 odd years in the British Army and I did nine years in Germany during the Cold War and um, in what was then Western Germany, of course. Um, and in the Cold War, we did uh, exercise on a regular basis. Every year we did major exercises as did the Soviet Union forces, the Warsaw Pact forces on the other side of the inner German border. So there was always concern when anybody was conducting big exercises and we conducted some, you know, some very big exercises. And actually in the early 1980s, the Russians were genuinely very concerned that we were planning to actually move across the inner German border and invade them. So, so these exercises always cause tension, but I do think there's something that's going on this time, and there may be various reasons behind that, which we could discuss. Um, do, do you think um, we're seeing that here, that uh, the Russian president uh, Putin is really exploiting um, the weakness in the West because it was back in 2014 that uh, Russia annexed the Crimea from the Ukraine. Uh, they backed the kind of Russian separatists uh, and uh, a conflict that's been going on now for the past seven years resulted in the deaths of over 14,000 people. Uh, and yet we barely get any news coverage of this at all. So do you think it's uh, an act of Western weakness in responding to this crisis that uh, Putin is escalating it? Well, I think there's a number of things going on politically and economically. I think, um, I mean, Russia itself is pretty economically weak and obviously has a certain amount of political instability, although Putin's um, rule seems to be pretty solid. Um, it's possible that they're putting pressure on the new US administration um, to say to them, come on, we need to get together and look at the, um, the Minsk agreement that was signed back in 2015 as a sort of roadmap. They may be doing that in order to try and consolidate their gains already and um, try to make sure that they don't come up against any resistance uh, of, of you know, moving out from where they currently are, never mind about taking over more. Um, 
and they've been pushing quite hard around the world. I mean, their involvement in Syria in the Middle East has been very interesting. They've tried out a lot, a lot of equipment. They've tried out new tactics and so forth. So the Russian undoubtedly are putting pressure on the West. And the question, of course, is how should the rest, West response to, respond to that? I would throw into the mill here that there's a, there's a project called Nord Stream, which is a major uh, offshore natural gas pipeline that the Germans have been building. Uh, huge political uh, capital have been put into that and in defending it because the Americans have been very upset. The previous administration under Trump was very upset about this and the Biden administration has made it clear that they're not happy either. It's, it's a Baltic city, a Baltic Sea pipeline that bypasses Ukraine. At the moment, gas coming into Germany from Russia comes through Ukraine and the Ukrainians get a lot of money out of that. This new um, pipeline under the sea, the Baltic Sea pipeline will bypass Ukraine and um, it, it's about 90% complete. Some people are saying it could be open by June and that will take away from the Ukraine a lot of revenue. But apart from that, it also sends a message potentially, and you've always got to have these conversations in the context of not just what we think, but how, do, is, how is perception, what does perception look like on the other side of the, of, the, of the engagement here? So the Russians may well think to themselves, actually Germany's building this pipeline. They don't seem to be that interested in what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, will they be prepared to fight over this, um, you know, new administration and so on? So uh, they could just be testing, testing the water, and pushing back, see what the responses are. Now, having said that, there have been some pretty firm responses. Um, the, the US have said uh, that they, you know, are not happy with what's going on. They've made that very clear. Joe Biden has made a statement saying he will stand by Ukraine. So is the EU. So is the UK. And Prime Minister had a conversation earlier this week, making it clear that, you know, we would stand by them. But significant concerns, we'll stand by you, unwavering support. I mean, these are political messages. You know, what do they mean? How seriously will people be prepared to implement them is a whole whole new raft of questions. So considering that uh, the US European command is on, has raised its alert level to the highest level possible, um, do you think that this conflict could escalate if we see that uh, Russian forces actually start to invade the Ukraine? And could this potentially turn out to be a war between NATO and uh, Russian forces? Well, Ukraine, of course, um, has uh, applied for uh, membership of NATO and NATO has made it very clear that they're, they're happy for, NATO, for Ukraine to become part. Uh, and you're right, they have put the, the US European Command has, has, been raised, has raised its alert status. Um, the question here is, is the West really prepared to go to war over this? Now, there are all sorts of uh, ways of responding to these crises. Obviously, there can be political pressure, uh, calling in you know, diplomats and diplomatic pressure and so forth. And there can be economic pressures. Um, but the, if I'm brutally honest, the European Union's uh, ability to come to some co coherent and cohesive response to this, I, I think is pretty far-fetched. Um, I mean, the EU commissioner, uh, current one, who's been, been in the headlines over the, all of the, of the uh, COVID-19 business, was, of course, the last West German defence minister. And I don't know this lady, but I know that the West German defence forces are not in a good state. She did not do a great job. Um, and the other NATO countries in Europe, the European NATO countries, you know, are not in a particularly good place. So the chances of them agreeing to go to war over Ukraine, I just think is pretty slim. So I think there's lots, lots to be played for. And I think the Russians will be taking that into consideration. Now, that does not mean to say that Saka and um, UCOM and all the rest of them will not be putting pressure on through the military committee, through the NATO military committee, and there won't be all sorts of conversations going on at the moment. And when we talk about responding, you know, we're not necessarily talking about Western troops rolling into the into Ukraine to support them militarily, but we may be talking about you know various options that they could be looking at. Tim. Uh... Russia and Ukraine signed an historic agreement back in 1994 called the Budapest Memorandum. And uh, uh, the Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons um, in order so that they would not be attacked by Russia in the future. Um, in hindsight, was this a bad mood on behalf of the Ukrainians to actually give up their nuclear weapons and their nuclear weapons deterrent? Well, again, you've got, to go, you've got to go back to that period of history to, to see why they were prepared to do that. And 
there's no doubt that Russia is in, in serious breach of that, of that agreement. Um, but why did Ukraine do it at the time? Because they were worried about Russia was potentially going to get up to. And of course, in the end, Russia did get up to it. So I, I think the short answer to your question is they do probably regret it. But why did they do it at the time was because the sort of pressure they were coming under and that they were certainly not, you know, close to becoming part of NATO at the time. So they were basically on their own. And I think they just, you know, they just gave in to the pressures that were being applied at the time. But I, I suspect they do, they do regret it now. I mean, I have to say, I don't, I don't regret that they've given up nuclear weapons because the less nuclear weapons are around, the better. But, but um, yeah, I suspect that they, you know, they'd, they'd certainly like to have been in a stronger position at the time. And they responded out of relative weakness. And at the end of the day, when nations respond out of weakness, they give up things that they regret. So, uh, Major General Tim Cross, thank you so much for joining us on um, Behind the Headlines. Um, fascinating to get your insight and your expertise. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Not at all. You're very welcome. Really great insights there uh, from Simon and Major General Tim Cross. We have this from Satinder. Good evening to you both. So glad you're covering this topic today as I've been following the news since the Russian troop movements last week. Russia has now also moved in tanks, fighter jets, nuclear submarines, and snipers too. Their military has really improved in recent years after substantial investment by their government. It's no longer the redundant rusty machine since the breakup of the USSR. Some of their most advanced weapons include a nuclear torpedo called Poseidon. It has a payload of 100 megatons, twice that of the SAR bomb the largest nuke ever detonated. It's specifically designed to create a massive radioactive tsunami off the US coast. I guess only Putin knows what his plans are, but you can believe it's sinister regardless. The question is, will NATO hold together after their many divisions as of late? Blessings so tender. And then we have this question, which um, you might give some feedback on. Um, Simon it relates to some of what we were discussing. Has this situation got more to do with a globalist financed ousting of a pro-Russian president and Russia's Black Sea fleet. Great show, God bless. That's from Hugh. Okay, I wasn't quite ready to go down that path, but, but since our viewers mentioned this, um, I don't trust Biden. I certainly don't trust the Democrats. I, I look at their kind of foreign policy. They back the Iranian regime. They want to re-enter into nuclear talks with, with Iran. Um, they are already wanting to re-enter talks with the Palestinian Authority, despite their support for kind of terrorism and, and funding of Palestinian um, terrorists in Israeli prisons. Uh, and uh, the position of uh, the Biden administration regarding the European Union and Brexit. So therefore, I really have to question uh, what their intention is regarding this unquivocal backing of the Ukraine. Yes, Ukraine is an independent state. It's a sovereign state. So therefore, under international law, it ha should have that protection. Um, but I would say that on the social issues, uh, and we're talking about the liberal progressive uh, issues that the Biden administration are pushing so much. In fact, they're actually purging right now um, conservatives in the US military um, that are Republicans or those who support who supported Trump. So they are currently, that is what the Secretary of Defense is currently focused on right now. And Russia doesn't fit into this globalist New World Order agenda. Mm. Um, and that's why, this is why we could see a potential conflict between the West and uh, Russia over that one to bring Russia into this globalist uh, agenda and pursue these very liberal, extreme progressive policies that, that Russia is pushing back on. So we do have these elements, but also we have to look at Putin's desire. He mm. wants a restoration of those Soviet republics that were under um, that were under Soviet control until the fall of the Berlin Wall in eighty nine, and also the desire that he was so high up in the Kremlin and was part of the KGB and the whole operation of the, and the thinking, the mentality of the KGB is to bring about the downfall of the United States, whatever the cost. So there's still those Cold War ambitions, I think, within Putin. He wants to be recognized as a kind of world power, um, and, but he's having a lot of internal opposition. So this could also be one of the other main reasons why he wants to instigate conflict in the Ukraine. 
they got parliamentary elections mm -hmm. um, coming up in September in, in Moscow and throughout Russia. And his party uh, is losing uh, popularity. He's losing popularity. You know, he's just imprisoned a very popular uh, opponent to his regime. And what he needs now is a, a military adventure to distract the Russian people. Um, so this could also be one of the reasons why he's pursuing this. But also we're seeing that Russian state media is also blaming the Ukrainians, saying the Ukrainians want to invade Russia, which is absolutely ridiculous because they don't have the military capability of doing that. So we're definitely in a very dangerous chess game. And any false move on behalf of the United States or NATO and Russia could instigate and lead us into a wider pan-European war that then could lead us into a global war. So it shows you how fragile the world system is, and it shows you how fragile the times in which we're living in. And so far, NATO has responded, uh, the, the largest powers within um, that alliance have responded by condemning these um, actions uh, of Russia, or, or rather really more expressing support for Ukraine. Um, I think they're playing a very close game here uh, when it comes to how they're actually approaching Russia. Russia has said it will, uh, it will do what's necessary um, to you know, accomplish its means, whatever that means. I mean, we can use our imagination. I think it's meant and designed to provoke a bit of fear, sound a bit oh, sinister. Uh, we'll do whatever is necessary. <laughs> I mean, but it's also it's testing nice. this new administration as well in the Biden administration. I mean, that's yeah. the, the big difference between, say, President Trump and President Biden. The President Trump had that unpredictability. No one really knew what he was going to do, and no one really knew how he was going to respond or how he'd react to a conflict. You didn't want to push the wrong button. <laughs> Precisely. So, you know, that almost, in a sense, brought nations that are kind of authoritarian in nature and hostile to that of the West mm -hmm. to become very wary because they don't know what he might do. Uh, and that's why I think also Putin is wanting to push Biden and uh, see what what Biden will actually do. But the support that um, Putin is having to raise in Ukraine, once again, uh, unsurprisingly, if we go back to wars historically, propaganda is such a big part of instigating unjust wars. So um, to gain domestic support in Russia for a possible military invasion of Ukraine, uh, the media has begun to accuse the Ukrainian government of plotting their own war with Russia, um, which you, you rightly said a minute ago. It, it just doesn't even make sense. Um, Ukraine has no military power to even come near approaching that in any successful way. But um, the, they're using the death of a young boy, uh, particularly a heartbroken family has, has claimed that a five-year-old boy was ripped apart in a drone attack by Ukraine amid fears of renewed civil wars um, as Putin's troops have massed on the border. So, um, again, this is a highly emotive issue. You're going to have um, tragic stories, doubtless um, featuring people on both sides. That's how, how war tragically works. However, it, it's, it's very often the case that these um, stories have been historically concocted um, that often feature families, that often feature children, um, and they, they use one example to cover over the hundreds or the thousands of examples um, related to the other side. So we've already talked about the um, thousands of civilian deaths um, that have occurred um, in that eastern part of Ukraine already. Here's a story, perhaps it's, it's true, if so, it's very tragic, of um, a drone, non, you know, it, it, who knows how it could have been malfunctioned, but it it sees the the life of a child in undeniably tragic, but we can't avoid looking at okay, hold on, thousands, thousands of people here, uh, and that's the tragic reality of war. Um, tensions have been ignited further by. Images of mourners at um, little Vladek's funeral. Um, the boy's grieving family claim he was killed in a drone attack orchestrated by the Kiev government, um, which Kiev denies. And you can understand why they would deny that. It would be in their interest to deny it, even if it did happen. At the, at the same time, 
Russia hasn't exactly shown itself to be very trustworthy, have they? Um, you know, we, we see people on British soil. Let me remind viewers of the assassinations on Russian dissidents on British soil and the attempts at covering that up. No, oh, absolutely. A lot of stuff there. Abs but there's a lot of, uh, of, of stuff going on even on a prophetic biblical angle. Well, well I found, found this interesting article. It said uh, from Prophecy Newswatch that uh, when the uh, Ukrainian president, uh, Zelensky, signed the decree number 117-2021 on the 24th of March, he said there was initially a declaration of war against Russia. And since that time, Russia has been massing along the border in numbers that have never been seen before. It says that once uh, the Biden administration took control of the White House, they decided to wage a campaign of maximum pressure against Russia and uh, Ukraine as one of the key tools in using that. Uh, the Ukrainian president, uh, Zelensky, uh, would never have signed this decree. Uh, on the 24th of March had not been with the encouragement of the Biden administration and extremely aggressive statements about Crimea in the document deeply alarmed the Russians. So it's even more importantly, it appears that the Ukrainians were secretly preparing a massive offensive uh, against areas of eastern Ukraine that were held by the separatists. I find that a little bit unlikely because we would have known about that. There would have been news reports of massive build-up of Ukrainian troops ready to take over the Crimea. Maybe they're thinking they can do that with the backing of NATO, but this all depends on whether Biden gives in to pressure on the Ukrainians to allow Ukraine to become a, a, a new allied member of NATO. Mm. Then the ball completely changes. But I think as we are coming down to the close of this programme, we need to f see where Russia fits into Bible prophecy. Of course, it's mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And it's interesting that uh, Major Tim Cross talked about, General Major Tim Cross, sorry, uh, talked about this new pipeline that the Germans were building that would bypass the Ukraine and Russia, which would furiate the, the, the Russians. But we're also seeing that Israel now is rich in natural gas and could then also export natural gas to Europe and bypass Russia. So you can see that these could be the economic or financial hooks that lead um, an aggressive expansionist Russia to actually invade Israel. So we are seeing that we are living in precarious times. And I think what we're seeing more than anything else is the breakup of the post-Second World War infrastructure, such as NATO, the UN, uh, and other organizations as the world descends in anarchy. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, again, viewers, um, take some time to go to Ezekiel 38 and 39. You might think, oh, I don't remember reading of Russia in the Bible. It's right there, um, uh, Gog, the land of Magog, that is actually speaking of Russia. In um, the RSV, uh, it actually um, speaks of the prince of, um, of Ross, the, the prince of Ross, which was an, an old term for um, for Russia, we can identify that region as Russian related. Uh, but whatever you do, um, please take some time to um, know that God is in control. Russia isn't sovereign. Ukraine ultimately isn't sovereign. Nor's NATO. We're not even sovereign. <laughs> sovereign. God, God, yeah, nor is NATO. God is sovereign. God is in control. He holds it all in his hands. Um, he is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the power of of all powers. He has this sorted. And uh, spend some time to pray for our, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, also those who are um, r remain in very difficult situations. Um, the, the, Jews, Jewish the Jewish community is, is particularly also um, going to be caught up in this. Um, bring these before the Lord in prayer. Ask that the Lord would work out his perfect plan and purpose um, in these people for his glory. Um, this is Behind the Headlines. It's been a pleasure to be here with Simon again this evening um, for this important program. I pray that it will have been a blessing to you. We'll be looking forward to seeing you next week again where we'll go behind the headlines and look at what's going on from a biblical perspective. God bless you all. Have a good night.